You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers about hikers for everybody. Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. Join Steve and his guests every week as he staggers from Georgia to Maine. Hi guys, and nice to have you all tuning in, if you know what I mean. You're listening to Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, the ultimate midlife crisis. And yep, I'm Mighty Blue, the guy who had the midlife crisis and through height in 2014 at the age of 61. And as if that wasn't enough, I went again last year at 66. This week, being Christmas week, the show will be a little shorter than usual. We've still got a guest and I'll be reading Walking the Appalachian Trail at the end, but there's no ATC middle section this week. And they must have presumed that I'd take a week off around this time of year and didn't schedule a session. For those of you who've been with me for some time, you know that I don't take any weeks off. But as I say, this is a shorter show, but still worth your time. Our guest today is Trevor Hendry, or Bear. Trevor is a member of that rather small class of 2020 through hikers, and as you'll hear, he's a thoughtful young man with a very considered view about the trail and his experience on it. The reading this week features somebody new to me, but once again, his thoughts on the trail, especially on finishing it, mirror mine in so many ways. That will be on after Trevor. I may have a few more things to say than usual after the interview, but let's get on and meet Trevor Hendry, or Bear. Here's Trevor. So, Trevor Hendry, or Bear, hiked the AT this year. He wrote to me about it, and I invited him to come on the show. Hi Trevor, how are you? I'm doing all right. Yourself, Mighty Blue? I'm pretty good, yeah. Now, as I understand, you were originally section hiking the trail in 2016 and 2017. Did you do the whole thing in two long hour section hikes or, and to complete it, or were you doing smaller sections with the intention of doing it over a number of years? So uh, I actually did uh, two uh, smaller sections, uh, one in 2016 and the other in 2017. Um, I had some exposure to the trail uh, from YouTube online, and it's something that really uh, piqued my curiosity. So I decided in 2016 to uh, give it a go. I started from uh, Springer, and I hiked all the way to Franklin. And then in 2017, I, uh, I picked up from Fontana Dam, and I hiked through Hot Springs. And uh, okay. this past year, 2020, is when I did my end-to-end through yes. hike. So. Yeah, so <laughs> what made you want to do the whole thing in of all years, 2020? Well, you know, I'm just in a position in life. I, I, I remember last year, I have some uh, through hiker friends. They hiked the trail in 2017. And, uh-huh. um, you know, he asked me a few questions because, you know, he knew I had interest in the AT and, and um, you know, it had been in my mind for a while. But, uh, and I think we sometimes create, you know, excuses for ourselves. Um, sure. Uh, you know, small excuses at that. And, you know, to not do things. And, and he asked me, he said, look, do you have a mortgage? I said, no. Do you have kids? I said, no. And he said, well, what reason do you have not to hike the AT? And it just hit me in a moment. I said, man, I got to do this. And so from that moment on, um, I, I really started making solid plans to hike in 2020. Yeah. Now we've actually, this, this is a postponed recording because we were intending to do this some time ago. So my memory is not the best. So I've got, I always have to take notes and I took some notes here. You're 23. Is that right? When you started? Uh, I was actually 22, and then I had my birthday, uh, my 23rd right. birthday in Hiawassee. So ha- had you finished college, you started a career, or were you doing some part-time jobs just to save up for this? I was doing part-time work just to save up for this. Um, you know, I didn't tell many people at the time while I was on trail, but, you know, I used to work uh, at, at a church prior before, and then after that, um, once I had some exposure to the AT and I decided I want to do it, I just started um, after I left, after I left there, I just started working part time jobs to save up for the trail. Do you say you worked where in a pri- in a in a church? Yeah, I actually worked uh, with the youth ministry at a church. Yes. Okay. Oh, that, that's interesting. And uh, we didn't, have, you know, funnily enough, I didn't have that in my notes at all. So, did you um, did you find the let's say relaxed nature of life on the trail to be in any way a conflict with with your spirituality or not? Um, not at all. Uh, I didn't find it conflicting at all. Um, you know, if anything, I thought it brought me closer to people. 
And, um, you know, I think that's initially what my interest was, um, you know, in, in working with the church was just having community. And I thought right. the, that the AT uh, provided e- an even better opportunity, actually, for that, just to love people and to learn from people. That's cool. That's a great answer. I like that. And and from my notes, as I say, I, I, <laughs> they're a bit sketchy. They always are, actually. You started on March the 8th, and, and, and there was quite – that's correct, isn't it? There was March the 8th? Yeah, March 8th. Yeah. Yeah, and there was quite a bit of knowledge around – about – COVID at that time and stuff started closing down, I think about a week later. Did that give you any pause when you when you were going to start or had you made the decision that whatever was going to happen with this disease or this pandemic, you were going to start anyway? Yeah, I was pretty dead set on uh, on hiking the trail. And at the time, you know, my thinking was, is, you know, we've, we've seen, you know, flus and, and seasonal things come, you know, uh, come through and hit us at, at times. And I didn't, th- I didn't really think much of it. I thought it'd be something that, you know, was just seasonal and then it eventually would dissipate and I won't have to worry about it. So uh, my mind was pretty occupied with what I needed to do to get on trail at that point. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Yeah. <laughs> so you headed off and, um, and I'm curious cause I haven't actually heard this from anybody. So what was the conversation like on the trail in the shelters at that early stage? And I presume you were, you were, you were camping around shelters. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I was I was camping around shelters um, in, in in the beginning beginning because just because of the sheer amount of people that were, were out there. At the sure, time, yeah. sure, yeah. So what was what was going on? What were people thinking about what you know what was happening in the rest of the world? Well, to be honest, there wasn't much of a conversation until we got to Hiawassee, and uh, I, I remember it was my birthday, March the thirteenth, and we had went into the Ingalls downtown there, and uh, yes. you know we noticed that everyone was. Uh, clearing out the toilet paper and and all the uh <laughs> happy days yeah, yeah, exactly you know people were were just running around going crazy and we're like man well this is uh this is actually starting to get a little real it's it's affecting us it's it's personal at this point you know we you know we didn't know um i, I guess from that point on what uh resupply would look like so th- those yeah. were, those were thoughts that were going into our head at that time but you know anyways we just trudged on and Eventually, it all came to a head at Fontana Dam. I remember that's where that's uh, when the conversation really started to get serious. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, were you getting? Because I'm interested in this early part of the stage where mm-hmm. we're all still learning stuff. Will we, we? I mean, I had I had the news on all the time because mm-hmm. I just didn't know what was going on. And that weekend that you started, I went to a podcasting conference. There's a thing from the past where we all shook hands with each other, you know, and uh, <laughs> we're in close proximity to each other. Um, were you getting any pressure from home as people heard, probably heard the news even more than you did? No pressure. No pressure at all, um, actually. And, uh, you know, I, I did feel a little pressure to take more precautions in, in the airport. I, I remember at that time, you know, we started to see – uh, some people with masks going in. And at the time, I thought it was a little odd, but, you know, I just shrugged it off and said, okay, well, they're just, you know, taking preventative measures. Um, yeah. But in the very beginning, you know, on, on trail, there really wasn't much talk about the coronavirus until uh, until that weekend of the 13th uh, when all the news spread. I, I remember I was at, um, you know, because I started March the 8th, I was at AT kickoff. Um, you know, all right. the vendors, everyone was there. Sure. It was a big happy Gosh. time. And, and, there, and, yeah. and that wasn't a topic of conversation, um, at least of the people that I would talk to. It was funny, wasn't it, to see masks in those early days anyway. I, I remember I used to travel on business a lot and I went to Japan a lot. And my One of my first trips was 1986, I think it was, to Japan. And I saw some people walking around and it, apparently when they had got a cold in Japan, they all wore a mask. So it wasn't entirely alien to me, but to see it in America was a really odd thing to see. But now you just see them all the time, don't you? You didn't have a mask with you at all on it, on your trip, did you, or not? No, I didn't. I did not bring a mask, and uh, for whatever reason, along the way, I never bought a mask. I just used my mid layer to cover my face. All right, I see. Yeah, okay. that, that's another great reason for buff. That's right. So, so tell us about the, the early the, the, in those early towns. Basically, your impression was of seeing things like uh, um, <laughs> raids on toilet paper. But you say that you reached Fontana Dam, which of course is the gateway to the Smokies. Mm-hmm. Um, was that before the Smokies had closed or, or you said that things started to happen? What actually happened at Fontana Dam? Yeah, so I actually got there. I, so I took a zero day in, in Fontana Dam. So I got there the day, the day prior to the park closing. Um, uh-huh. So I spent the night. Then the next day I, I took a zero. And that's when we started to notice that um, 
some of the sh shops were, were starting to shut down. They even um, mm -hmm. they had some park personnel come down and shut down the bathrooms uh, and okay. the showers by the by the Hilton there. And then the next day um, is when I eventually got into the park. But um, I entered the park an hour prior to the park officially closing. Um, from, wow. from what I was told, rangers started showing up about an hour or two after I got I got inside the park. But even before the smoke is, you you were at the N O. I'm trying to get my chronology right here. The N O C. What was that like? Because that's normally jammed with people, and it's a really great buzzy place. What was the N O C like? It was a ghost town. Uh, the general store oh there was was open, um, limited hours, but outside of the uh, the nice young lady at, at the counter there, there was nobody. Um, it was just the people that I was hiking with and around, um, and it was totally vacated. That's weird, isn't it? Really, that yeah. really must be yeah. weird. So, so you got in the Smokies with an hour, with an hour to spare. Um, how how were you planning on doing the Smokies? Because the traditional way is to do three days or two days or four days, um, getting to Newfoundland Gap, then going in Gatlinburg, resupplying there and going out again. Mm -hmm. But as I understand it, you you decided not to go into Gatlinburg. You were going to try to do it in one push. How much how much food did you have to take? Well, at that point, I was feeling pretty good. Uh, Physically and, and mentally, I, I was ready to, to take on the Smokies. You know, you hear so much about it. Um, yes. And it's all know, true, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For, for a lot of people, for sure. I ended up having beautiful weather, but my, my, my thinking was at the time was okay, you know, I could probably just straight shoot it, uh, go from end to end with, with, on one resupply. Um, and so I, I think, how much did I carry? I probably carried about five days, five, six days. Um, worth of food okay. yeah, and you know I knew I was I was aware when I got my resupply there that there's a possibility that regardless of COVID or not that that road um, up to Newfound Gap could be closed and the last thing I wanted uh, was to you know go into Gatlinburg <laughs> to get and, yeah. and then not be able to get back on trail I actually knew yeah. I actually knew some people who that happened to and they had to uh, after finishing come all the way back and, and finish up the second half of the Smokies. Oh, interesting. So they close the road. Uh, how can they? Mm, that's interesting. How do they yeah. do that then? I don't understand that. Was it just because of weather they closed the road? Because I know I, I was blocked out because of the weather in 2019. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't go up. We had to miss a day, a stay an extra day in G Gatlinburg. Um, but so they were actually preventing people going up who were hiking. Was that, th was that the thing? Yeah. So when I got to Newfound Gap, there was nobody. Um, not a car, just just some crows in the parking lot, and it was completely <laughs> oh, vacated. Nobody. Um, oh so my my, gosh. So I'm assuming that they just closed down the road. Um, they they shut down the road to Klingman's Dome as well. Uh, not a soul at Klingman's when we got there. Um, so well, that's not you know what that's not a bad thing. Trust me, Klingman's yeah. Dome on a crowded day is not a lot of fun. <laughs> so were there many smoke? Were many rangers around in the Smokies at that time? And were they trying to herd you off? Or what was it? You know, what was the atmosphere? What were they trying to do? Were they trying to just encourage you to get off? Or what, were they being more aggressive about it? So I, I we didn't see or hear about any rangers in the park itself. Only at the entrance and. They were definitely not encouraging. Um, they were they were pretty firm in uh, in saying that the you know the park was closed and that you cannot right. have any entry. Um, and as far as I know, uh, for the people behind me, they even started patrolling the bridge so people couldn't uh, walk across the bridge there into the park. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So, but once you're in, then they didn't try to hustle you off the trail. Then no, no, none of that. No. Okay. And and we've heard this year that Hot Springs was pretty hostile to hikers this year, but you had a better experience in Hot Springs, didn't you? And not only at the Smoky Mountain Diner, which I love, by the way, oh, as you yeah. get into Hot Springs, um, but there was also, also the, there was the lady there and also the friendly sheriff. Tell us about those. So there was an older couple um, that, you know, they were hiking and we met them at the Smoky Diner. Shout out to, to those guys. Um, you know, they were great, like you said. Uh, but we were told by them that the night prior when they got into town, the sheriff actually picked them up and got them a room at the uh, at the local hotel there. Uh, I, f I forget the name of it, but um, yeah, no no expenses paid. I mean, it was it was on the sheriff. I, I guess he worked in conjunction with some party. I, I don't I don't know all the details, but um, you know my experience in Hot Springs um, wasn't like some others. I, I you know for the most part everyone was pretty friendly. 
Yeah, you know what? I'm really glad that you've put put some sort of counterpoint to it because it seems to me that everybody's been negative about hot springs this year, and you know, well, people were worried, I guess. So you know, I'm glad there's there's some positivity about it as well. So and then you told me that this is when your hike really began. Why did you say that? Well, I, I felt like my my hike really began in Fontana Dam um, pri- oh, right. pri- prior okay. to even getting into the Smokies. Um, that's, you know, that's where I felt like those, those very serious conversations about COVID and, and how we were going to respond to it were happening. Um, you know, and it was at that point where I made the decision for myself that, look, I'm, I'm, I'm weighing the pros and the cons. Um, you know, I'm thinking of others, but I'm, but I'm also, you know, thinking of myself. And I made the decision from that point on to do, to hike the trail. Um, there is a lot. But of, did you ration, did you rationalize it in any way, or or did you? I mean, is this a conversation you had with yourself and others, or you just thought, sort of, I'm going? So there were conversations uh, with uh, some of the people that I was hiking around at, at the time uh, about what they were going to do because um, two of them ended up getting off. But I didn't really have any many one on one conversations about what I was doing. I had to work that uh-huh. out internally amongst myself. Um, and the way I rationalized it, you know, was just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at where I live. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the, the logistics of getting to and, and from there. I'm also thinking of what resupplies might be looking, you know, down further on the trail. All sure. of that was uncertain. So I had no idea. And you can imagine so early on in your hike, you know, one, you're just trying to adapt to the to the environment around you. And then, you know, we had to adapt to the circumstances around us. And so I knew if I was going to go forward that I couldn't be indecisive, that I had to make a decision. And I felt like at Fontana Dam, that's that's really where it all came to a head. And I said, I'm doing this regardless. And, uh, you know. And, we'll see where and from your happen. experience, that, from your experience, then Trevor, did many people choose Fontana Dam as the place to get off? Then yes, a lot of people were going to the uh, lodge and getting picked up from there. Um, right. Yeah, there is, That's there's sad. quite quite How a bit. How sad of people, that must yeah. have been. Yeah, that must have been sad for you as a fellow hiker as well, because people you've been you've been a, you know, you you get close to people very quickly on this trail, don't you? And I'm sure you notice that. And to to suddenly sort of as it were lose them is kind of really sad that the. They, they had to get off there. Um, and so did you feel that this this year was a lonely year to be hiking the trail or were you with other people at the time? Well, you know, I think that depends on who who you are hiking around and your own individual uh, journey. You know, for, for some, you know, I, I know from, you know, personal experience because they, they told me, I remember talking to one gentleman in hot springs and and he told us at the smoky mountain diner he says look i'm i'm getting off i'm getting off because it's not the hike i thought it was there's not as many people and yeah. i came out here for the community um it just so happened at that time um at the hilton where i ran into several individuals who i would eventually hike uh, the majority of the trail with so oh. i was fortunate enough to have um people around me and so I think within that little bubble of ourselves, we were able to um, encourage one another and keep each other company during those times, which really helped. All right. So where did you where did you start traveling with people then? Pretty much, you know, from right when we got into the park and in, into the Smokies. And uh, all right. So I, I met a few individuals there, and then I eventually would link up with uh, some more people. Actually, a a couple uh, a couple of people from. Um, from England, uh, who I hiked with uh, for most of the way. In, uh, yeah, I wouldn't trust them. I wouldn't trust them at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I met them shocking at the people, shocking people. <laughs> yeah, I met them at the station nineteen, which is a great place, by the way. Great I know exactly what awesome. you mean. Yeah, yeah. And and your initial email to me and another subsequent actually, when you sent me some more notes, um, told us about some of the kindnesses you received. Quite apart from hot springs, um, yeah. tell us about some of those. Well. You know, I think if you can detach yourself from what you're uh, reading online and just just stay <laughs> present. Pretty important. Yeah. Pretty important, by the way. Yeah, very <laughs> important. And stay present in a moment with what you're doing out there, the people that you're around. Um, you know, as you know, if you ever hiked AT, kindness is overflowing and there's so much love and community out there. Um, you know, I, I think it, it originally started with uh, my hostel experiences um, because at that time we just didn't, we didn't know what, 
lodging would look like. We assumed sure, that, that sure. wherever we're going, we're just going to have to resupply and then get back out on the trail. We didn't sure. think we'd be able to convene somewhere and meet other hikers. And so mm. um, uh, Jim from Boots Off Hostel, they um, in, in Hampton, Tennessee, they threw a Easter, yeah. uh, an Easter party for, for the hikers. Oh, did they? They? We had a awesome. big Easter feast and oh, that worked right. its way up the trail. And we're like, yeah, or, you know, a bunch of, you know, free food, you know, on the trail. It's amazing. So <laughs> um, we eventually got there and it was a great time. Um, and then even after that, um, or I think it was before, prior to at the station 19, we, we were just uh, received by them with open and loving arms. And, you know, I, I think that's when I realized, okay, it's not going to be, it's not going to be as bad um, as we thought. Uh, granted, you know, I think a lot of hikers nowadays, they go into the trail, you know, expecting, or at least at a subconscious level, expecting trail magic. We didn't get any of that until uh, I'm sure. Pen- Pennsylvania. I'm sure. Um, yeah wow that's amazing but besides that um the majority of the people that we met out on trail um hikers um hostel owners and you know all the above everyone was 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 pretty great nice and you said you were traveling with some people but as i understand you also you were with them for quite some time and as often happens groups split up and you went on ahead in new jersey is that right yeah. Um, yeah. Why? You, why? Why did you? Why did you decide to do that? Well, I love the dynamics of being in a group on trail. Um, I think it's great, especially in the beginning. Uh, just just because you need that camaraderie. Sometimes you need the encouragement um, and the company of other people. But eventually, it got to the point where I really wanted to engage people on more of a one on one level. Um, and so I thought the best thing for me would just be to, you know, go out and 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 hike on my own for a little bit and see who I can meet along the way and. You know, I really enjoyed the second half of or the last third of my hike just because I was I was able to do that. I hiked on and on with with different groups along the way, and um, right. And yeah, it was, it was so. Awesome. Were you speed? Were you speeding up then from New Jersey? No, quite to the contrary. All right. So All right. yeah, I actually got off to a pretty good pace. Um, All right. In the beginning, pretty much all the way up to uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And right. that's where I remember, you know, I took, uh, I took five days off there. That was the first time I had spent more than 24 hours, um, off of trail. And then it was really after that, that's when I started to slow down. And, uh, you know, eventually a lot of the people who were hiking behind me, um, would catch up and I'd have some good times with them. So, so you say you, you took five days off in Great Barrington? Five days off. Yep. Wow. Good old and days that in. was... You, oh, you stay, You actually stayed in stayed in Great Barrington, okay? Yeah. So, what was it like? That's interesting to take five days off. That's a long time to take off. What was it like to get back home? Was it was it, was it you know were your legs just as strong, or you know, were you, did you cope with it easily? I felt I felt so. You know, my body at that point was starting to feel a little you know a, a lot better. I think um, it was mainly mainly the heat. The heat at that time was what was giving me the most trouble. Uh, my mm-hmm. knees were feeling good. I had uh, my feet were feeling good. I had. Um, some pretty bad knee issues, um, pretty much all the way in through all the way until I got up through. Um, you ought to, you ought to be sixty seven, mate. But worry about knee issues. <laughs> Going downhill on sixty seven year old knees sucks. Yeah, it, it, it <laughs> yeah. does suck. It's not it's not easy, is it? It really isn't. Yeah. And was there a kind of as the summer went on, was there a kind of a relaxation in people's attitudes? Did you notice? Because you were getting flip flop, as I understand, starting in in Harpers, weren't you? Yeah, around May or June, um, that's when a lot of flip floppers got on, and uh, that's when I felt like the attitude was uh, starting to change. It wasn't as solemn, and and right. uh, I don't feel like there is as much quote unquote you know hysteria going on as there was prior, uh, and yeah, I think I definitely think. People started to get a little more lax, uh, and there were more day hikers and section hikers as well as the through hikers. Oh my gosh! You want to talk about <laughs> the day hikers? Whew. I cool. mean, so they all smell nice. They all smell nice, don't they? Uh, like <laughs> soap and artificial scents. Yeah, they, it, there is <laughs> there is a, a massive influx of of uh, day hikers on trail at that time, and you know it makes sense. You know, everyone was you know, locked in their homes for weeks, almost months at a, at a time. And uh, eventually when things started to relax a, a little bit, everyone came out. Um, I remember the first first day hikers that I had seen, um, I'd run into them around, I think it's 
three point three is it three point it's it's in virginia um three mountains no, or, or whatever you call it but it, it was in uh, northern virginia when we started running the day hikers and then in pennsylvania that's when we really started to notice the the massive influx of, uh, of people trying to get out on trails yeah, people have been locked up all, all year, mate. You've been out having a good time. People have been locked up. They want to get out. I entirely understood it when people wanted to get back on back on the trail. Yeah. And I knew there'd be an influx of people. So, you know, that's, that's kind of part of it. You've had a very different hike this year. I want to talk about that in a minute. But um, so you got a Monson and Shores. Do you stay in Shores, I presume? I sure did. I stayed there six right. days. <laughs> Oh, you certainly did. Well, that's interesting because so I was going to say, what was the atmosphere like there? Because I know in previous years it's been jammed because people do tend to hang out for a day or two as they sort of gear up for the hundred mile wilderness. You stay for six days, so you yeah. must have seen tons of people. What was that atmosphere like? I did. Um, people were moving in and out uh, pretty quickly. I, I think it, there wasn't. I don't think too many people there. Uh, my experience is wonderful there. Poet and, and hippie chick are are great owners, and they really go out of their way and uh, to to support and love on hikers. And um, yeah, yeah, it really it felt like a loving home to me. Did you get the lecture as you go into the hundred mile wilderness from uh, poet? You know, I didn't get poet's <laughs> lecture. I did not, but I do. Oh, I do have a story. Right. He did. He did. Right. Um, go away. Um, to actually, I think he was, he was taking his daughter to climb Katahdin. Uh, for the for the first time, oh, wow. and uh, there is a big influx of hikers who are coming in on that weekend. And as you know, he makes the best hash browns. Oh yeah. Well, he wasn't there, and there was a lot of things going on, so I had to step in and help. And I ended up <laughs> getting on the hash browns. Well, I managed to burn all the hash browns and ruin the breakfast, but. Good effort. Oh, yeah. A for effort, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you were probably part of the furniture, by the way, if you were staying for six days. But you eventually headed out. You went to the 100-mile wilderness, which is awesome, by the way. And I and I, I, I um, slap-packed the 100-mile wilderness in 2014 when I did this hike. But when I did it last year, uh, I did it. I did the whole thing, which I, I'm so glad I did. You know, staying in the in the staying in there every night, I just loved it. And if I ever did this again, I would love that hundred mile wilderness again. But you got there, you got to Katahdin, or you got to Baxter, and but as I understand, you you, you actually summited Katahdin by yourself. Is that right? I did. So um, some of the people who I was uh, who I was hiking around with at the time, they didn't want to spend a week at Shaw's, so they ended up uh, <laughs> moving on naturally and uh, sure. finishing out their hikes. You know, for me, the, the way I wanted to finish, I, I wanted to, I don't want there to be any delay between me hiking in the 100 mile and then me summiting. Um, and so I bought my plane ticket at Shaw's. I think I, I gave myself five or six days um, All right. to get through and oh, then wow. eventually get to Portland, Maine. So I, uh, I pulled some miles through the 100 miles and um, I, I did a 30, a 25. Um, an, an, another day and uh, eventually you know I, I got to the birches and I actually wasn't wasn't able to get in touch with the ranger uh, in the evening that I got there but eventually in the morning I you know I was you know able to and sure. I made my ascent up to Mama K. But you were by yourself? I was I by mean, myself. I mean you were, yeah. weren't you at the top by yourself as well? Yeah so I woke up that there. Mu- hang on that must have been awesome up there by yourself looking around that's such a great desolate place and i love it up there it was marvelous i was the first one on the mountain i got up pretty early um, right. and i couldn't believe it i couldn't believe there's nobody ahead of me and i, I remember it was it was there's a layer of clouds um it wasn't right. perfectly clear but you know it was still gorgeous in its own right and um just the way the clouds were moving up above the you know the ridge and, and the sign there was just as as you've probably seen, it's uh, it's gorgeous. And I remember right before I I got to the top, there was a a raven that flew right above me, and it, oh man, wow. it was just yeah. yeah. I say I could I could tear up thinking about that sign. Just that view of it when you suddenly see it for the first time, you know roughly where it is. You can kind of see this hor- this horizon, but then you actually see the sign. I mean, it's, and to have nobody up there. I'm just thinking about it now, walking up there. Um, mm-hmm. To see the sign by itself must have been just awesome. So you got there, and you, you had no one to take your picture, did you? Nobody to take my picture, and it was cold, and it was windy, 
And so I hid underneath the boulder for a good 30 <laughs> minutes before uh, somebody else came behind me who would, who would actually, you know, he was finishing up his hike, but I had never even met him before, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is a marvelous thing. You know, you could meet people along the yes. way, all the way up to yes. the finish. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. And the finish, and the finish was 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 strange in in its own right. You know, for for so long, you are you know you're thinking of of what's ahead of you, and um, your your mind um, becomes trained to think like that. And all of a sudden, it's there. The end is right yes. in front of you. It's almost violent. The ending, isn't it? You know, it's so sudden. That, you know, you you'd be waiting for for it all this time, and you get a view of Katahdin 50, 60 trail miles away, and it's in your head all the time. Suddenly, you're there, and then it's over, and you have to go down again. I mean, it's almost like a violent ending to me. It just hits you in the face right away. It did to me anyway. I don't know if you feel that way. I was very numb. I will say that. Oh, interesting. I was numb to a lot of. My feelings and emotions at the time, it just, the enormous gravity of something like that, a hike, uh, like this year, it, um, it, it just couldn't register in one single moment. And I'm still, you know, I'm still processing that, obviously. Sure. I, I think, as I told somebody the other day, I think I've at last processed my 2014 hike. It's going to be another couple of years before I do my finish, finish processing my 2019 hike. So this is a thing that does take a time uh, to get through. And, and from what you know about the trail and, and through hiking in other years, are you still glad that 2020 was your year? Or would you have preferred to have gone, say, I don't know, a year before? Because you miss so much of what a through hike is about. But I'm sure that what you went through probably compensated for some of those things and had its own different elements that nobody else has had. Yeah. Um, the community was still there. I was still surrounded by some pretty wonderful people, hikers, um, hostel owners, um, and, you know, people, just people along the way who, regardless of how, you know, how long they're hiking, they're, they're out there. And, um, and I learned so much from, from the people around me and, uh, I wouldn't have any. I wouldn't wanted to have hiked on uh, in any other year. I I definitely feel like the beginning of my hike, and especially my moments at Fontana Dam. Um, yeah. It what it what it forced me to do was to take a very deep uh, look inside myself, my drive, my motivation, my heart, my rationale, and it, uh -huh. I think it solidified a lot a lot of those things uh, very early on in my hike, which. Um, which allowed me to gain momentum as I was going up the trail. And in a year like this, when there is so much against us, um, you know, I'm the kind of person, I have a chip on my shoulder. And when, <laughs> when something, when something or somebody tells me I can't do something, uh, naturally I just have to fight back against that. So. Well, I, I noticed you sent me a couple of takeaways. You said you didn't want, you mentioned the third one, which everybody says, which is true, of course, the amazing people. Um, your two other ones were interesting. Uh, you didn't want fear to dictate your decision making, which is a really good lesson for life, by the way. And, and also to stay fresh and flexible, which is another good lesson for life. What, what did the trail, what did the trail give you that you wouldn't otherwise have got anywhere else in life? trail so i think you know, the first thing that comes to to my head there as you ask me that question is um the trail becomes this i don't know if this is the right word for it but a microcosm of of life um you start somewhere and that's your beginning and that's your your birth and then you finish it and that's your your your, I guess the death of, of your hike as, um, you yes, know, I was, I was listening yes. to your podcast a few podcasts ago, you were talking with, um, you know, with some, with some of your guests and they explained it that way. And, uh, yes, that's right. Uh, chickweed and kaleidoscope, kaleidoscope, I believe it was. And yeah. I, I, the, the trail <laughs> encompassed all of that in, uh, six or seven months. And for yes. me, it was very important coming into this trail um, to start something, not only just to start it, but to finish it. Um, there, there have been a lot of things in my life that, that, I, th that I believe I've, I've started, but I, I didn't see it all the way through. Um, I, sure. I either quit or, or gave up. And, and for me, I put a lot on this hike. Um, this, this wouldn't, this wouldn't be, uh, an opportunity for me to, um, to quit something. I, I would see it all the way through. So. 
Yeah. Very cool. Uh, you know, that's a very, very cool answer. I must say, and I, and I don't wish to sound patronising for a young man, you have really got your head screwed on about what these, what some of these things mean to you. So I, I applaud you for that, for taking so many great lessons away from Nike. And, uh, you know, thanks so much for reaching out and and, um, and coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for, uh, for having me on and just uh, opening up the discussion for all different kinds of uh, people and hikers and it's important to have these d- discussions and, and to learn from one another. I totally agree. Well, thanks a lot, Trevor. You take it easy, okay? All right. Cheers, Mighty Blue. Cheers. Bye. I told you that I thought he was a thoughtful young guy, didn't I? I liked him a lot and was particularly interested in how he managed his hike, especially slowing down and spending six days in Monson. You'd think that people would want to get done by that stage, and many of us did, of course, but for some... It's almost a loss in their lives to finish the trail and and several want to make it last as long as possible. As I say, I thought that Trevor conveyed this really well and it was certainly my experience in 2014. I started catching up with people towards the end who were far faster hikers than me. They just wanted to stay on the trail. Before we hear about Luke the Journeyman Wiecek, I wanted to let you all know that I'm keeping the map competition open for another week. Apparently some people have been having difficulty in getting their entry to me so I thought I'd keep it going until the last show of the year. Maybe one of my many emails isn't working anymore. So if you haven't entered yet, email me at steve at hikingradionetwork.com and tell me in how many states on the AT can you find the red eft. Don't overthink it, by the way. It's easy to find out. So get your entries in and you can own one of these truly fabulous maps. Second, of course, I want to thank those of you who donate to our shows. This week, I want to thank Catherine Fauci, the Hiker Yearbook, of course that's Odie, for their donations, plus a continued gift from one of our monthly benefactors, Vicky Thomason. It is so humbling to get that email, and I never take it for granted. I spent a lot of time putting all these shows together, and if you enjoy listening to them and want them to continue, please consider clicking on one of the donate buttons on our hikingradionetwork.com site. Cheers, one and all. And talking of our website, remember... There's a microphone button that allows you to leave a message to me or any of our podcasters. As I mentioned last week, I'd love you to use that microphone to share your hiking knowledge and tell our listeners any tips that you've learned over the years. Just think about it. Sharing a good piece of advice could literally save a fellow human being's life out in the woods one day. And that ain't nothing. And of course, I couldn't let the episode finish without wishing you all the happiest of holidays in whichever way you celebrate it. Just stay safe have a great time. So now, ending this week's show earlier than normal, it's Larry Luxembourg's Walking the Appalachian Trail. And this week, we'll be meeting a new name to me, Luke the Journeyman Wiacek. I hope that you're all getting as much of a kick out of this book as I am. It was only 25 years ago, but to me, it seems like a different era and almost a different trail. I'll see you next week. I-O-W-A. Idiots out walking around. Surprises and misconceptions. Being taken by its narrowness for chosen company is indeed one delightful aspect of the Appalachian Trail. One easily recognises those whom the trail has chosen. One senses kindred spirit. Some folks say the chosen are a special breed. I mean, If you enjoy, if you can really get into going up mountains where you can might nigh stand up straight and bite the ground or can thrill in downward descent where a person wants hobnails in the seat of his pants, I mean, you'd be a special breed. Mountain wilderness lovers are chosen company. Bruce Otto, 1974 through hike report to ATC. I can't explain what it will be like, said Ross Ridge Runner, Geradian. They're never really going to know what it's like till they get out there. The AT offers surprises even for veteran hikers, and beginning long-distance backpackers find new discoveries around every bend. Hikers learn about people and nature and what they have inside themselves. It's possible that no one ever had a worse start to a backpacking career than Keith Wolf Kimball. His first trip in 1989 was an attempted through-hike. He had a 1978 data book, but no maps or guidebooks. He had never read a book on the AT and didn't know anybody who had backpacked. I went to backpacking stores and bought junk, he said. My total load was £85, even carried two backpacks. On May the 15th, Keith started in Maine. He mistakenly walked to Avon Bridge instead of Baxter State Park, which meant he had to walk 18 extra miles. On that walk, he learned a little about what he'd need. 
he mailed home 25 pounds of gear from Abel. Among the supplies he kept, three boxes of pancake mix at two pounds each, three pounds of spaghetti and several glass jars of jelly, which are heavy and messy if they shatter. He started with five sets of clothes. An experienced backpacker might have one spare set. All his clothes were soaked within a few days. He wore logging boots. They were waterproof, chainsaw-proof, insulated with a steel tip, but much too heavy for backpacking. After climbing Katahdin and resuming his southbound trip, Keith was hurt only six miles south of Abel Bridge. At Rainbow Ledges, he slipped on some rocks and fell a couple of feet. His ankle was twisted and he couldn't walk on it. He spent 26 days, an almost biblical timescale, covering 100 miles of wilderness without seeing another hiker. Today, an experienced northbounder can do that section in five days, although rangers at Baxter suggest preparing for ten days. The rest of the stretch became a saga of determination and mule-headed perseverance. He could have hobbled back to Abel Bridge, but he decided to press on. I wasn't going to go home and tell them I walked 17 miles and quit, he said. He spent many nights in the rain because he couldn't make it the full distance between shelters. He counted 23 days of rain out of the first 26. On top of that, it was blackfly season, when all but the hardiest or greenest outdoorsmen stay clear of the main woods. By Monson, Maine, Keith's ankle had healed. I'd sworn as soon as I hit Monson, I'd quit, he said. But I spent one night in Monson and decided to continue. I got cleaned up and felt better. I got good food in me. People in the town cheered me on. I figured it was worth another shot. It really inspired me. By Garfield Ridge in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, he met his first through hiker. It made me feel better, Keith said. I knew I wasn't the only crazy person doing this. He'd gotten his pack down to 30 pounds by then. He ended the trip in September at Delaware Water Gap, Pennsylvania. He had only $15 in cash and the bus ticket home cost $17. He called home and his mother refused to pick him up, thinking he was joking, so he walked the 100 miles home to Levittown, Pennsylvania. It was a tough trip, he said. I had 67 days of rain out of 100. Then I stopped counting. It was wet. I thought it was tough, but fun. I liked the challenge. People were really friendly, but I was very lonely. Now, Keith's an experienced hiker who travels with an extremely light pack of 10 to 15 pounds, including food for five days, a sleeping bag and a tarp. In winter, he carries 30 pounds. Once, he carried only a fanny pack for five days. That's kind of tough, he said. I've done without every piece of equipment in my pack, including my pack, he added. He's completed the AT twice and done part of a third trip. In the summer of 1993, he hiked the Pacific Crest Trail in four months. Most hikers come to the AT expecting a wilderness experience. The physical and mental challenge of completing the trail is often the attraction. It's a surprise to most of them that their biggest pleasure is often the sense of community forged by their fellow hikers and the trail angels. As long as there have been hikers, there have been people, trail angels, willing to help them. Although there are occasionally curmudgeons, more common are the people who hold out cold drinks or offer a bed for the night. It restores your faith in mankind, said two-time through hiker Phil Pepin. There are a lot of good people out there. For most of the 80s past, long-distance hikers have been sparse. Dick Hudson, who finished the trail in 1970, remembered every long-distance hiker he met in the four years he hiked. Since then, long-distance hiking on the AT has grown rapidly. In 1990, the record year, 212 people reported finishing the AT. Thousands more backpack shorter stretches. Despite the increased number of long-distance hikers, the trail still appears wild to most of them. However, if you begin at Springer Mountain at peak time, late March to mid-April, there's lots of company. Of course, it's all relative. A crowded shelter on a rainy night may house only eight people, but it's a long way from solitude. Then, as you go north, the crowds thin out. Some people think of better things to do with their summer, and others speed up or fall behind. It surprises some how quickly strong friendships form among hikers. I don't know what it is, but if they have a backpack on and you're heading in the same direction, it's like you've just met your next friend, said Connor, Carolina Cooker's coward. It's like a ritual or initiation that ties you together. It was the closest I've ever felt to people. It's because you don't know each other's backgrounds, said Dorothy Hansen. Everybody's a hiker, and you're all equal in the eyes of the trail. As for why the bond is so strong, she suggested that it's because it's such an elemental thing we're doing out there sharing the essentials and the really vital parts of living in such close proximity. Perhaps it's the relative anonymity of it too. It's safer sometimes to talk to somebody out there than to somebody in your regular life. 
Maybe it's the common goal and common dreams. Almost everybody is there for a little bit of soul searching. Another possible explanation is that although most hikers are in an introspective mood, they prize whatever company they have. Many hikers worried about doing the trail alone, trying to find a partner before they start. But anyone who shows up at spring or in April soon finds hiking companions, though it is admittedly hard to form durable hiking partnerships when hiking pace varies and the dropout rate is high. Personal chemistry is critical in such a stressful partnership. Another surprise is how physically demanding the through hike is. It's still, I think, the best physical conditioning experience you can have, said Elmer Hall, proprietor of the Inn at Hot Springs. You don't have to pay $100 a week to do aerobics. You just walk 10 miles a day. You'll get in shape. After four to six weeks of steady backpacking, most people are in the best shape of their lives. Still, aches and pains are a regular feature of trail life. Your body takes a pounding day after day. I had a different ache or pain every day, said Phil Pepin. Always something hurt. I would walk like an old man for a couple hundred yards coming out of a shelter, he said. He'd be better after he got warmed up. Bob, sweet peeler foot, Hill counted 14 blisters during his first few weeks on the trail. It was slow going. I had heavy German boots. I thought they were broken improperly, but apparently they weren't. In New England, he had dysentery for three days. In Massachusetts, he had to rest for a month with a hairline fracture of his foot. Bob's other surprises were more pleasant. Also a PTT end-to-ender, he said, The AT is a botanical paradise. There's nothing like the smokers in the spring or New England in the fall. It was more painful than I expected, said Marilyn Passalman. I thought it would be a nice walk through the country. But she added, It was great having that time living away from civilization. It's more work than you ever do otherwise, but it's real work. You're close to the land, close to nature. I got discouraged a lot, just like you do in real life, but you have to pick yourself up and keep going. The most discouraging thing was in Pennsylvania, when we saw two rattlesnakes. We were inches away from the first. The biggest fear for a woman is rattlesnakes. I was going crazy. But she and her husband, John, completed the trial. Now I think everything's possible, she said. With a little money and imagination, you can do a lot. I'm not afraid to do things like homeschool for my children and other unconventional things. You always want to see a romance to it, but it is a job, said Rick Hancock. In some ways, it's easier to prepare for a through hike than it's ever been. Detailed planning guides and videos have been produced in the past five years. More and more experienced hikers are willing to provide information. All the fall gathering of long-distance hikers is a prime resource for prospective through hikers. Most veteran hikers advocate some physical preparation for the trail, such as running or climbing stairs. But as Jim, Jimmy B, Bodmer, a 1990 hiker, put it, I thought I was in good condition, and I was in good shape for what I was doing before the trail. I just wasn't in good condition for backpacking, but much harder than I expected. Of course, there's no way to fully prepare for the exertion of hiking 10 hours a day up and down mountains carrying a 40 or 50 pound backpack. By starting slowly on a long trek, you can work into shape, but on shorter hikes, you may never get into top-notch shape. One way to mentally prepare is by expecting misery much of the time and realising that other parts of trail life compensate for the suffering. Expecting to escape unscathed is a sure path to disillusionment. New backpackers, worried about their time, tend to start too fast at Springer. They don't realise that although an eight-mile day in the Georgia mountains might seem tough in April, a 20-mile day in Virginia two months later might seem easy. Hikers who start fast risk becoming injured or discouraged. Greg Poo Nertner began a northbound hike at the end of April. I was haunted by this feeling that I had to hurry the whole trail because I was a late starter, he said. Money can be another surprise. Most middle-aged or retired people find backpacking the AT for six months a cheap way to live. But many students and younger people have their trail experience diminished or even ended because they run out of money. The current rule of thumb, at least for long hikes, is that you'll spend $1 to $1.50 per mile. But Warren Doyle spends perhaps a tenth of that, and other hikers spend two or three times as much. The easiest places to spend money are restaurants, hotels and grocery stores. Some hikers, repelled by civilization after living in the woods, keep their town breaks brief. Others find a renewed appreciation for such luxuries as refrigerators, garbage cans and running water and stay for days. 
One trend that's become common in recent years has been younger hikers, with no deadlines, backpacking as far as their cash carries them, then finding odd jobs to replenish their finances before moving on. New hikers can take inspiration from Bob, rerun Sparks, and Leonard, habitual hiker, Atkins. Both came to the AT in 1980, and neither covered even half the trail that year. Both have gone on to finish the AT three times. Bob lacks only a few sections for five completions, and although he's in his 70s, he's eager to return to the trail. He began with a six-mile walk near Harper's Ferry in September 1979. His reaction was, This is easy. I can do this. The following April, Bob was back on the trail. He does not consider that incomplete 1980 trip a failure, but a learning experience. Leonard found that he was not serious about thru-hiking in 1980, but took side trips and partied, and generally enjoyed himself. Since then, backpacking and hiking have become a way of life. He met his wife, Laurie, the umbrella lady, on the trail, and they married at Peaks of Otter, a picturesque setting of mountains and a lake along the Blue Ridge Parkway, which was formerly part of the AT. Leonard, who has hiked all over the country, has authored four hiking guidebooks, including one on hikes along the Blue Ridge Parkway. On my first trip, not knowing what to expect, I was frustrated, Leonard said. I'm in North Carolina. Maine is still way up there. I was not accepting the way the trail went. I was fighting the trail. The second year, I looked at every day as a day hike. In 1989, two hikers used IOWA, Idiots Out Walking Around, for their trail names. As the slower of the two, Harry H.B. Fisher one day put 15 pounds of rocks into partner John J.B. Brown's pack. When they reached the shelter at the end of the day, John said, Man, my pack feels so heavy, and found the rocks. It's a trick that more than one through hiker has suffered. On a 1976 through hike, Susan Gale Airy didn't find the rocks for five or six miles. She retaliated by putting a frog in the culprit's water bottle. Harry and John walked 40 miles one day into Damascus, Virginia. On the same day, Bill Stats Godrick Gunderson did 33 miles, earning his honorary idiot status for doing such a gruelling hike. Few people come to the AT with less hiking knowledge than John Indiana John Stevenson. If there was ever any greenhorn that went out there, it was me, he said. I didn't get the right pronunciation of Katahdin until I was in Maine. My first time up Katahdin, I didn't even know where the top was. I went to the Tablelands and thought that was the top. I met someone at Abel Bridge and he said he was going to climb Katahdin. I said, I'm sore, but I went anyway. I was planning on doing Maine, maybe, and then going back home. I never realised there was a world like that I could aspire to. By the main New Hampshire border, I had decided to do the whole trail. I came across another hiker with the guides and maps. The guy had planned for 15 years to do the trail, but he had heard his knee crossing a creek, and that was it. It was ironic that I finished, and he didn't. Profile. Luke, the journeyman, Wiacek. It takes a serious person to keep at the trail, mile after mile and day after day, accumulating those five million steps. But it's refreshing to come upon someone like Luke, who laughs easily about his adventures. His thirst for travel not yet quenched, he has bicycled cross-country and plans to do the Alaska Highway. We talked over dinner. As Luke says, with through hikers it always comes back to food. Luke, the journeyman, Wachek, had a five-year plan to propel himself across the United States. He would hike the AT from Georgia to Maine and spend the winter in Maine, cycle to California and winter there, hike the PCT and winter in Washington State, cycle to Alaska and sail in the spring from Alaska to Greenland by way of Cape Horn. Asked if he was a sailor, he replied, no, but I wasn't a hiker either. He's made adjustments along the way, but he's completed a remarkable amount of his plan. In 1990, with partner Kristen, the journalist, Guter, he bicycled from Key West, Florida to Springer in 17 days, then hiked the AT. The next year, he bicycled cross-country. The year after that, he bicycled from Katahdin to the northernmost point in Maine. It's called Wanderlust, he said. I can't get it out of my blood. I like the natural ways of travelling, seeing things at a slow pace, not zipping down a road. The more you do, the more you want to do. From his AT hike, Luke has gained the confidence to tackle other adventures. As he prepared to cycle the Alaska Highway, he said, I don't have any worries about this trip. I know I'm going to be wet and cold. The bike's going to break. The pack's going to break. I don't even consider it anymore. I just know the experience, the scenery, is definitely worth it. 
On Luke's first day on the approach trial to Springer, he ran into Joe, the Italian scallion, Barella. I see this old guy in a rain poncho and shorts and lightweight hiking shoes. He starts walking across this wooden bridge, saying, You know, you have to watch out for this stuff. It's slippery, you could fall. I'm thinking, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. That night at the Stover Creek shelter, Luke found out it was Joe's second through hike. I started to learn right away that you can't judge people by their looks out there. That first night, while everyone was lying in sleeping bags in the shelter, Joe said, the elements are no big deal. The walking's no big deal, but you have to get used to the mice. You'll be lying there sometimes, and the mice will run right across your sleeping bag or right across your forehead. Luke looked over at Kristen and she looked at him. She had this, oh my God, look, Luke recalled. The next time I looked over, she had a sleeping bag pulled up with just a nose sticking out. She was scared that the mice were going to carry her away or something like that. Joe Barella also told them, you'll get your trail legs after about the second week. You'll know you're a through hiker when you find yourself walking and doing nothing but talking about food. We said, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, crazy old man, was he? No, Luke said. But in a couple of weeks, we were coming down this hillside, a nice gradual descent, nice cool area. And I said, if there was a Burger King around the next corner, what would you order? I started it. We just got going and spent the entire day talking food, strictly food. Another time, Luke and Kristen were with a group camped outside of Hot Springs. They made careful plans to do the food thing right. We would go in first thing in the morning and catch the all-you-can-eat breakfast and then go to the all-you-can-eat lunch and do the all-you-can-eat dinner. So we all stopped nearby. We were in the shelter and done eating our measly portions by six o'clock. It was three hours till it got dark and it was a little chilly. There were six of us in the shelter lying there with nothing to do but dream out loud about what town was going to hold as far as food. And we spent five hours just lying there talking about food. The next morning, it wasn't the usual, oh boy, we've got to get up and put the pack on. It was, all right, town's right round the corner. We were running down the hill. It was fantastic. Like pregnant women, through hikers get strong cravings for special foods. I remember the fried chicken craving hit when I was five days out, Luke said. It's in your dreams. You're lying there and pieces of fried chicken are dancing before your eyes. I remember walking into Dots in Damascus, sitting down at the table, getting a menu, reading it. The waitress came over. I said, two fried chicken dinners, might as well just bring out the desserts with it. Large Cokes and some extra rolls. She said thank you and started to walk away. I said, wait a minute, the lady would like to order too. Before my hike, I ran into a through hiker at Sunfish Pond in New Jersey. He said, one day when you're on the trail, you go into a town have a whole large pizza, then go get a pint of Ben & Jerry's ice cream. Finish that, then figure out where you're going to eat next. One time in town, I had a large pizza and was just scraping down the Ben & Jerry's when it dawned on me. That guy was right. Through hikers typically eat foods that provide a lot of carbohydrates, are easy and quick to cook, require little water and are lightweight. For many, that means ramen noodles, macaroni and cheese, peanut butter and instant oatmeal. By the time a hiker finishes the trail, he's usually willing to part company with those foods for a long time. Oatmeal, said Luke with unconcealed scorn. I would sooner plaster the walls with it than eat it. I'll eat cold, stale bagels before I'll eat oatmeal in the morning. Luke recalls a visit in southern Pennsylvania from a trail angel, Rex the Keystone Cop Looney. Rex showed up at the shelter with three large hot pizzas and a backpack full of beer on ice. Luke thought, man, I can't believe it. This guy's carrying pizza. Who is he? Where are his wings? In New Jersey, Luke and Kristen took a break to visit their families. People said, if you get off in your hometown midway through the trail, you'll never want to get back on. But I was ready. The whole time I was off, I had the itch to get back on again. When Luke returned to the trail, his father walked with Luke and Kristen as far as Sunfish Pond. It was a walk they'd done many times before, but this time it was different. I had my pack on and I knew that I was going to continue walking, Luke said. At the pond, they talked for quite a while. At some point, we both realised it was time for Kristen and me to go. We stood up, I gave him a hug and said, we're going. He turned south, back to the car and the normal life, and we turned north and started walking back into the outdoor world. It was a strange feeling, like a parting of the ways. Luke had originally planned to do the trip solo. On a group bike ride, he explained his plans to Kristen, casually mentioning that she was welcome to come. He didn't expect her to take the idea seriously, but she did. He found the partnership quite beneficial. A female partner provided a different perspective. 
and people were friendlier and more trusting than they would have been with a lone man. A couple of guys, solar hikers, in the south had bottles thrown at them, said Luke. They mentioned they were jealous of us. Seeing a woman along, people were more apt to be respectful, and getting a ride into town was easier. Women hikers can benefit too, since they are reluctant to hitchhike alone. The year Luke and Kristen were on the trail, two through hikers were murdered at the Thelma Marks shelter near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. A few weeks later, a man was arrested when walking into Harpers Ferry, West Virginia, and later convicted of the crime. While hiking in northern New England, Luke heard about the murders. Most hikers remained on the trail, but became more cautious. You naturally become family with the people you're hiking with, Luke said. We found that when news of the murders spread up and down the trail, the bonding became a lot tighter. Trust in strangers just walking down the trail became a lot less. Everybody knew that the guy who did it was still out there. Normally, you'd come up to a shelter, automatically drop your pack and start talking to the people. A lot of us were more inclined to keep the pack on and evaluate who was sitting there. It took a while for everybody to start talking about it. It was just like the death of a family member. The same year in Tennessee, fish hooks were strung up along the trail at eye level and the Don Nealon shelter was burned down. It was weird to go from a carefree manner where all you're concerned about is do we have water? Do I have any cookies left? Where are we going to sleep tonight? To is somebody going to bother us? Are there going to be real problems? In the Whites, in New Hampshire, Kristen and I both started realising that it was going to come to an end too soon. The hundred mile wilderness was not long enough. By that time, the temperatures were nice, the scenery was nice. Near the end, Luke still didn't take finishing for granted. I remember thinking to myself that the only way I'm going to say I'm going to finish the trail is when I'm about 10 yards from the sign. Because I know if I trip and fall and break a leg, I could still crawl and touch it. And then they reached Katahdin at the end of the trail. We were sitting at Katahdin Stream the day before Summit Day, Luke remembered. I said to everybody, if you could have anything you wanted, what would it be? It's funny how your ideas change. I'm sure if I were to do it now, I could list things that cost tens of thousands of dollars. But I remember at the top of my list were dry socks and a new pair of boots. Those are the biggest things I really wanted. Adjusting to society after the trial was difficult for Luke. When you get down to the basics, spend six months out there, you find out what really matters, he said. The basic physical things, staying dry, warm, food, water. To go from that frame of mind to, I make this much money, I drive this car, I'm going here, I'm getting this, I'm doing that, that's a real adjustment. Another adjustment was sleeping in the same place more than two nights in a row. Thinking, I'm going to be in this exact same position, this exact same location, every night breaks number of months or years. That was a big adjustment. I don't sleep in a bed, I'm still in a sleeping bag on a thermarest. There's always that feeling in the back of my mind that I still want to go. And I know the more you have, the harder it is to go. I don't think I've adapted yet. If you enjoy the trail, it stays in your mind, in memories, in pictures. It stays with me in the sense that I appreciate the simple things. I understand what the basics mean. I'm like everybody else. I get caught up in the wants and the haves. But I still know I can revert to staring into a candle or a fire and going back to any given point on the trail and refocus on what it meant. I still think about the trail every day. 365 days a year. 